Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to a special edition of Arts in the City all about books. There's almost nothing I love more than a great summer read. Pair that with sunny skies at the beach or a glass of wine on my couch and I call it a perfect day. Hudson here even joins me sometimes. So let's settle in for a half hour with the authors behind a few of my recent favorites, starting with the hit thriller An Anonymous Girl. We sat down with author duo Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekkanen at the Pierre Hotel's 2E Lounge. Sarah Greer, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. It is really a thrill. Oh my God, thank you so much for having we us. We are so happy to be here. So I've read both of your books. Uh, complete page turners, could not put them down. Uh, your most recent book is called An Anonymous Girl. Let's talk a little bit about that. If you could just explain how the story unfolds without, of course, giving the ending away. So I'll take this one. You take us one. An Anonymous Girl is the story of a young woman who lives in New York City. Her name is Jessica, and she's kind of struggling to get by. She, you know, is trying to earn money, trying to make her way. One day she finds out about a study on ethics and morality. And she thinks this is going to be a quick, easy way to make a little extra money. So she doesn't she, need it in New York. Right, yeah. right, a few hundred bucks. So she sneaks into the study. She walks into a classroom at NYU, and there's nothing in there but a laptop with the words Welcome Subject 52 on the screen. She begins to type to answer these very generic questions that begin, and quickly it seems as though the questions start changing. They're being almost tailored for Jessica by the mysterious Dr. Shields who's running the study. It seems as though Dr. Shields knows what Jessica is thinking and what she's hiding. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes from there. And it gets creepier yeah. from there, yes. Where did the premise of the book come from? The idea of this young woman participating in a psychological study, how did you come up with that? We knew we wanted a woman and a therapist, some kind of a relationship. We didn't exactly know how it was going to unfold, but that was the basis because it's such an interesting dynamic that we feel that you're a, a client has with their therapist and also the relationship the therapist has with their client. Yeah. And what are they thinking? When you sit down to write a book like this that has so many twists and turns, mm -hmm. are you trying intentionally to trick the reader? Yeah. <laughs> Good, I, I like the honesty. Right. Well, I like I it. I mean, yeah. yeah. We well, want to surprise you. Yes, and you yeah. appreciate want, it as yeah. a reader. We want to spin you guys around and have you gasping and say, I never saw this coming. I thought I knew what was going to happen. Absolutely. Sarah's in D.C. and I'm in Manhattan. And so we, early on, even though we came up with this idea to write together, we didn't really think about the practical right. part of it, about <laughs> how we were going to do this. We, early on, decided we wanted to write every line together. And then the question was how. And so my daughter, who was then 13, set us up on Google Docs and Google Hangouts, which we didn't know what it was. I mean, it's <laughs> embarrassing, funny. but yeah. for anyone out there who's watching who doesn't, it enables Sarah yeah. and I to be looking at separate screens, but we're looking at exactly yeah, the, the same, same material. Document, yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. in each other's homes, basically, even yeah. though we're in two different cities. Yeah. At this point, yeah. we're eating lunch together and yeah. talking. Yeah, and the writing. politeness yeah. has gone out the window. Yeah. Yeah. But then we take these breaks, we say T and P, T and P. Are we allowed <laughs> to go get some tea and go to the bathroom? <laughs> Tell me how it began, this idea of you two writing together. Yeah. I love this story. I know. It's like our, it's or, a it's our origin story. story. It's our oh. origin story. So. Yeah. When I was working at Simon Schuster, I submitted Sarah's debut novel, The Opposite of Me. You were the editor. I was the editor. I loved it, and I acquired it. And over the years together, we worked on seven of Sarah's books. She had seven solo books. And over the years together, we discovered we had a number of uncanny similarities. So we both had studied psychology and journalism. We both had played field hockey in high school. We're both terrible cooks. <laughs> um, we're both the exact same age. Um, 29? We both, uh, yeah, 29. We both have, me too. We, <laughs> <laughs> we both have brothers who we're really close to who are both, both named, named Robert. Robert. I mean, it's weird. Eerie. It was yeah. weird. So we had these eerie similarities. Yeah. And then when I decided to leave corporate publishing, in the back of my mind, I wanted to write. But I really wasn't telling many people because that's a, it's kind of a scary thing to put out yes. there. But Sarah and I stayed close, and I, did, I told her. And she said, let's write a book together. Uh. But it must be sort of like any other relationship yeah. or like a marriage then. Yeah. You have to work at it, right? So is there a secret? 
to how Hon you do that? Honestly, it, it is so something. good. We don't, we don't oh, argue. We don't fight. Don't we think. come on, girls. We I, maybe I, we're in the honeymoon I, phase, I know, but we're like in year four right now, and we yeah. are closer than ever. I'm also a lousy cook, so maybe I can hang out with you guys. Sometime. Totally. Oh, yes. We're in. Oh, yes. Right. Yes. 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 I'm really good at that. Okay. Oh, same, same. As much as I treasure a good laugh, I also love a story that dives into history. Enter author Therese Ann Fowler and her book, A Well-Behaved Woman, a novel of the Vanderbilts. She stopped by my apartment to chat about it. Therese, thank you so much for coming by. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm delighted to be here. So your book is called A Well-Behaved Woman. First of all, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. It's about the Vanderbilts, and you know, I, I think I know a bit about the Vanderbilts, but I was surprised I'm not that familiar with this story. So can you give us a little bit of a description? Sure. Well, I mean, that was the experience that I had, too. I've heard the name Vanderbilt, but I didn't really know very much about any of them. It was um, when I came upon this article about little Gloria, who we know as Gloria Vanderbilt, and the custody battle between her mother and her aunt that I first became intrigued with the family in general. And so with each successive generation, I was moving backward in time yeah. to the point where I came upon the Vanderbilts sort of as they are coming to be um, in society in New York City in the late 1800s. And it turns out that there was a key woman involved in that evolution, and her name was Alva Smith. She marries into the family and then kind of becomes this, um, I don't know, she's like a lightning rod of a woman in her time, and I was, of course, fascinated by that. Well, as you describe it in the book, she uh, married William Vanderbilt essentially for money. Absolutely. Because for they money. were desperate, or her family was desperate That's at right. that point. That's right. She didn't necessarily expect to love her husband, she just needed the marriage to work so that her sisters could be supported, and her father, who was an invalid, could be supported. She thought she was doing a good turn for the family. William is not exactly the husband she feels she deserves on some level. Well, I think she imagined that if she behaves respectfully, she will be treated respectfully. And the idea that, that these men can just go out and have whatever they want on the side, which was not an uncommon practice, she takes that personally, not just for herself, but for other women of her class. Both in history and in the book, Alva shocks everyone when she actually decides to divorce William. How do you think Alva had the fortitude ultimately to seek that divorce as opposed to right. do what would be more expected of her? Which is to just yeah. sit, you know, deal with it and keep her mouth shut. Well, so that kind of goes back to the idea of her being sort of less of the, the reputation that she's earned, right? If, if all she really cared about were her social status and her money, she would never have taken that action. She wouldn't divorce the man who enables her to have this place in society. It's not, it's not a sensible choice. So obviously she's driven by things that have nothing to do with materialism and have a lot more to do with self-respect. Alva lived a good long life and she was able to accomplish a lot of things, especially with the women's suffrage movement. She was a, a tremendous advocate and put not only her own money, but her time and you know, personal effort into that movement. Even though this book is you know, in the Gilded Age, there's a lot of relevance to discussions today about the way women are depicted, perhaps the way women are sometimes perceived, particularly strong women. That's something you talk about. What do you want readers to take away on that front? Look at how we still, and I, by we I mean women as well as men as well as the press, still characterize strong women who dare to behave in a different way than what we think is ideal for that person you know, in that situation. It's especially true about women who are in politics. As soon as someone dares to you know, assert themselves in what is like the male sphere, the characterization of that woman becomes much um, harsher than it would be for any man who's pursuing the same thing. Well, Alva in the book, um, and, and I guess in life, was a, was a complex person. Sure. You said yourself that you weren't really sure you liked her initially enough right. to write about her. Why was that? Well, so if anyone knows something about Alva, what they believe to be true about her is that she was this pushy, materialistic, selfish social climber who seemed to be all about elevating herself 
that's the reputation that she gained in her lifetime and it has persisted since then. But as I got to know her better and started to recognize the complexities of the story and the context in which the things she did occurred, I thought maybe the reputation was unearned hmm. and that was fascinating. Your previous book, Z, was very successful. Very successful, yes. I have to ask, was it difficult for you to attempt another one in any way, to think like, I have to match that level of success? I knew that I had to produce a story that the readers who love Z would also find appealing. I mean, when I say I needed to, that's personal on me. I probably could have written anything and just said, but oh, you well, to. I had a successful novel, therefore I can write whatever I want. But that's not me. I think, you know, it's a kind of an act of faith between the writer and the reader where if you loved a thing that I did before, I really want you to love the thing I do next. Right. So, Therese, we always ask people this. Um, do you have any particular habits or quirks that are part of your writing, any rituals that you do that help you get started? I'm just kind of a workhorse about it. I write full time and I treat it like a job because I would like to get the next book done so that I can pursue the idea that's already, you know, in the back of my head about what to right? do next. Yeah. So you write at home or I you do. write elsewhere? I write at home. I have a, an office on one end of the house, on the second floor of my house, and my husband, who is also an author, has his office on the opposite end. And um, there's a lot of back and forth of cats. That's funny. <laughs> That's, I mean, you know, there's that joke about how you get cats and you think you're going to go ahead and have the serious occupation of whatever your profession may be, but in fact you've just become a doorman for, yes. the, for the cats. <laughs> yes. I kind of feel like that with our dog, so yeah. I know what Same you idea. mean. Same idea. Sometimes a romantic comedy is just what we want in a summer read, and we've got one for you. Good Riddance by Eleanor Lipman. It starts with a high school yearbook that gets thrown away and takes off from there. Eleanor, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. So your book is called Good Riddance. I loved it. I laughed out loud. Without giving too much away, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the story unfolds. It begins very short first chapter where this woman is sort of baffled. She's inherited a high school yearbook that was her mother's cherished possession, but she's not quite sure why. It wasn't her mother's class, but it was dedicated to her mother, who at a very young age had taught at the high school. Mm -hmm. So your main character is Daphne, the daughter. Who, Daphne, the daughter. Who inherits this yearbook. Yes, yes. And she realizes that she had, the mom had rather a, a sort of compulsively, obsessively gone to reunions and had made <laughs> notes over the years. About all the reunion. people in the yearbook. All the people in the yearbook. And not always in the most generous fashion <laughs> did she always, not always complimentary. Let's get back to the yearbook, which is oh, yes. at the center of the book. Yes. So how did you come up with that? This is one of the only novels I've written that where it sort of um, came out of real life, which was, I was at a flea market in Stormville, New York, uh -huh. and it was actually um, not me, my significant other. He comes running over victorious with this yearbook, which he bought. I said, you bought that? And it was for how much? $12. And I said, why did you buy a yearbook? Keene, New Hampshire, high school class of 1955. Huh. So he said, it's Americana. So Daphne, the main character, is a little bit lost in the book, would She's you say? She's definitely lost. She is. I, yes. She is sort of out of work. She's had this failed marriage. What drew you to that about her? I don't choose characters who have very high self-esteem. I like bringing, sort of sending my characters to charm school. I mean, yes. not literally. Yes. Or giving them, you know, bring, I'm the god of this world. Why wouldn't I make them happy? We have to talk about Geneva. Okay. Because she drove me crazy. Okay, in a good way? Uh, yes, but like it was sort of one of those things like I love to hate her. Well, she's the villain. Yes. She's the villain of the book. Yeah. She comes across as such a busybody. She's a busybody. She doesn't take no for an answer. Yes. She doesn't have too many manners either. 
So you're very funny in the book. I have to say there was a, many times when I really did laugh out loud, particularly when you described Geneva, because that really cracked me up. So are you always funny? One thing that always surprises me when a new book comes out is that a line I write that is just me, that's the way I think, or I find that I've said something that I think is poignant, that's just characterizing someone, and then I go to a reading and I read it and people laugh. In the readings I've been doing with Good Riddance, when she just says, when Geneva says, no, I don't want the cookies, but you have vodka. Now, I didn't mean that to be funny, nor do I particularly think. It always gets a laugh. I thought it was funny. Oh, see, see, <laughs> yeah, so. that's an example. Maybe you're funny and you don't quite realize you're funny. Well, it, that, I've been told that. We always ask writers um, this question. Do you have any particular quirks or habits or rituals that you do when you write? The ritual would be, I try to do it early in the morning, mm -hmm. and I rather obsessively polish before I move on. And part mm. of it is because I send each chapter to two wonderful friends. I call them the good cop and the bad cop. Mm -hmm. So I polish and polish and polish, because I, I don't want to waste their time. But I just, you know, sit at my laptop, drink coffee. What I have discovered is just faith in the process. The older I get, the more I value my girlfriends. You know what I mean, those few people in life you really laugh and cry with. This book, Girls Burn Brighter, is a story about enduring female friendship. We spoke with author Shoba Rao at Shakespeare & Co. Shoba, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So your book is called Girls Burn Brighter. It's incredibly gripping, uh, the story of these two young girls who have um, this very deep but kind of tortured friendship. Sure, yeah. Can you give us just a brief description of the story and how it unfolds? Sure. So it's about two girls, Purnima and Savita, who are growing up in a small village in South India. And one of them, Savita, gets trafficked into the United States. And her friend, Purnima, who ends up in a really difficult marriage, um, she ends up leaving that marriage and decides she is going to go find Savita. Now, she hasn't heard from her friend or seen her in two years so she's really starting with you know absolutely no information to go on but she's relentless. I was really struck that you decided to delve into the nature of female friendship with these two young girls who are not together for most of the book. Sure yeah. They're not in touch yeah. they really can't even be sure the other's alive. Yes I mean truly. Indeed. So what made you decide to approach it that way? Because we don't, it's not a typical way to look at a friendship, but yet the friendship drives the story. Yeah, well once I established uh, their deep connection at the beginning of the book, it felt time to separate them and really explore the strength and the deep sort of river of love that they have for one another. Um, and the best way I could conceive to do that was to separate them and ask how much, what will you go through? as friends, as human beings, to find the other. The brutality of what these girls go through is, at some moments in the book, just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, there's physical abuse, there's sexual abuse, there's human trafficking. Uh -huh. It does feel really relentless. What made you choose to make it feel that relentless? When I first started writing the novel, uh, before I started writing, I should say, I promised myself two things. One was that I wouldn't look away, no matter how bad it got for the girls, that I wouldn't look away. And the other was that I wouldn't flinch. Like I would look at it and I would do it unflinchingly. Those are the two promises I made to myself as a writer because I, I really wanted to honor the journey of these girls, you know? And it felt important to me that I not sort of dilute or in any way um, reduce their journey or make it easier just to make it easier. Right, just for the sake of, you know, palatability. Both of the girls serve as narrators. You, you yes. switch back and forth. And I thought that was a really interesting approach. I felt like I got to know both of them very well. Uh -huh. I was reading one and yet looking forward to the other, not feeling that I was more invested in one than the other. Oh, good. So what made you decide to do that? You know, I, I wanted to, um, it, I wanted it to be a quest 
right? So when there's a quest in a novel, there's an object or a thing or a person that is desired, that is, you know, the object of the quest. And so I thought, how interesting if we got the perspectives of both the person who was looking mm -hmm. and the person who was being, being looked for. for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, usually it's like a pot of gold or something, but in this <laughs> case, it's a person, right? So I thought, let's insert that person's perspective. So we always ask this question, do you have any particular writing habits, quirks, interesting things that you do when you write? <laughs> you know, I don't have any sort of particular everyday quirks, but in the writing of this novel specifically, because I was unable to write it in my apartment in San Francisco, I ended up borrowing a friend's cabin in the mm -hmm. Badlands of South Dakota. Really? Yes, in a really isolated part of the Badlands on open prairie. There was nothing out there. Just wow, that's interesting. And you just and stayed there until you finished? Yes. Two months, start to finish. And I knew I wasn't going to leave the, that, the Badlands until I finished. My Ex-Life is a novel about a divorced couple that reunites, but this is not a typical love story. The book had me laughing out loud, as did author Stephen McCauley when I met up with him at Barnes & Noble in Tribeca. Stephen, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Thank you for having me. So your book is called My Ex-Life. That's a very clever title. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Can you summarize the plot for us briefly? Sure. Um, very briefly, it's about a previously married couple who reconnects 30 years after they were divorced uh, at a moment of crisis in each of their lives. Uh, and things are very different now for each of them. Um, the husband is gay and the wife has remarried and she has a teenage daughter. And they reconnect around the bond of their friendship rather than their romantic attraction to each other. What inspired the plot of the book? I've always been drawn to this idea of people reconnecting with someone they knew earlier in their lives. You tell the story from a couple of different perspectives. We hear from David, and then we hear from Julie, his ex-wife, but then also from Mandy, right. Julie's daughter. So why did you choose to tell the story that way? I originally began writing the story in the first person from David's point of view, and I quickly realized that it was too claustrophobic and that it was I was more interested in finding out what was going on in some of the other characters' heads. I found some of the more minor characters in the book to be really hilarious. David's friend, Julie's neighbor. Right. Do you, is it easier in a way to make the more minor characters really funny because we only see them as readers in a way that's a little more one-dimensional? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, for me, it's like minor characters are kind of like people you have casual sex with, not that I'm assuming anything, but just that, you know, <laughs> that you only need to know so much about them. Right. You know what I mean? You don't need to know, like, what their relationship with their parents was like or where they went to summer camp or any of that. You can just focus on one aspect of their character. And I, I feel as if, you know, I'm sort of a minor character, uh, even in my own life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> How so? People always say, oh, were you there? You know, as if they don't remember me. There are some hilarious one-liners in the book. Uh, you must be so much fun at a cocktail party. I'm, you know what, I'm no fun at a cocktail party. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm very introverted, I don't drink, you know. <laughs> I'm horrible at a cocktail party. Okay, well do you have any one-liners in the book that are absolutely your favorites? You know, there are a few that I really like, but I, I sort of feel like when you talk about like, oh, these are my favorite one-liners, then they're not funny anymore. But I think <laughs> that my intention is with the one-liners is to write something that is funny, but also feels like it's true. It has some insight into the way people are and the way they behave. I am incapable of writing at home, hmm. even though I have a very nice study. And I've bought a little studio apartment not far from where I live to use as a writing studio, and I can't write there. So I have to write in a public place, like a really? library or a cafe or something. Yeah, where there's activity around me, so that the sense of isolation isn't as great. I understand that this is your first book out in eight years, is that right? That's true, yeah. So why that length of time? Any particular reason? Um, you know, I got behind in my laundry. <laughs> I was, I don't know. One of the things I did is I wrote two novels that were published under a pseudonym in between 
ah. that book and this one. But I think when I finished my sixth book, I kind of felt as if I was at the end of some project. And it took me a little while to figure out what the next one was. One of your books, The Object of My Affection, was made into a movie with Jennifer Aniston and Paul Rudd. I mean, that is very cool. What was that like? Uh, it was very cool. <laughs> it took 11 years to get made. Wow. Um, so by the time it came out, I had practically forgotten what the book was about, um, which is a good thing because the movie is so very different from the book. Would you like to see this one become a movie too? Sure. You know, I would love it. That is it for our special edition show. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully we helped you find something to add to your summer reading list. Toss it in your beach bag and go. If you want more details on any of the books we featured, just head to our website. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Arts in the City.